a, a nice webinar because we have such a big international uh, number of people joining us. And uh, I'm very pleased. My name is uh, Diego Gomez. I'm chairman of the Institute of Classical Osteopathy. And today we have uh, Robert Carwich, vice chairman of the Institute of Classical Osteopathy. He's going to do such an interesting topic for all of us. It's, uh, we're very lucky. Uh, he's talking about the osteopathic lesion. Uh, nowadays, the somatic dysfunction. <laughs> So I, I hope everybody enjoys. Uh, maybe we can just wait a couple more minutes for more people to join us. I don't know if this, that is fine. Uh, but yeah. Um, I'm just turning my phone off then, Diego. Okay. <laughs> so if anybody has got any questions, there is a question box at the bottom of the screen where you can type the question and I will either speak that to tell that to Robert or uh, send it to Robert. So may, may, maybe during the lecture we can answer some questions or, or well at the end of the, of the chat. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say, uh, you know, if, if someone asks something, Diego, just uh, um, interrupt me. And uh, if it, because often it's something which uh, someone's thought about at, when I've said something specific. So if it's something like that, yeah, that's, that's fine. I'm quite happy to sort of break off and talk about whatever that is. And uh, if either that or we can um, uh, do it at the end, or if it's something that I'm going to come to, I'll just say that I'll be covering that shortly. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, for those who just joined and don't know much about the, the Institute of Classical Osteopathy, we are, Dennis, we are an organization, we are based in in England, in Dorking, at the, in the south of London. We have been running courses for many years, since, since 1956, I think. And uh, we are running a new course now in September, running for five weeks, uh, four, uh, five seminars, four, four days each. And uh, all the information is in the website of the Institute of Classical Osteopathy or you can email us uh, icofrontdesk at gmail.com and uh, we are more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, we normally run these sort of webinars uh, every now and again. Uh, today is an open one with uh, Robert and uh, hopefully uh, soon we will have uh, a few more uh, coming during this year. So um, I think it's, it's time to start Robert if you want uh, so use and, uh, okay. Well, I will go to the share screen and then the, then uh, here we go. Keynote share and hit the play button. Can you see that? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, very good. I, okay, okay. So you do ask questions if you like to. My name's Robert Cartwright. Uh, I'm i uh, been an osteopath for 22 years and I'm Vice Chairman of the Institute of Classical Osteopathy. Um, what we're going to be talking about is the early research experiments that uh, the osteopathic pioneers did at the, sort of in the, sort of at the end of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, specifically uh, uh, Carl McConnell and then Louisa Burns's. Um, we're only going to be touching on some relative specifics on it because there was lots and lots and lots of research uh, back in those days and uh, when I say research it was more sort of experimental sort of uh, uh, research and uh, um, it was very reproducible but let's um, get into that in a few minutes. So before I start this uh, presentation uh, I always do warn people uh, that there's quite a bit of vivisection involved in in these experiments uh, which wouldn't be allowed these days but uh, um, 120 years ago, they, they, uh, animals didn't have the rights they do today, you know, obviously wrongly. Um, but this ex these experiments were done, and uh, these are the results that, uh, that, that were found. And it's, it's very relevant today as it was then. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this presentation is really a sort of typical teaching content that we do at the Institute uh, of Classical Osteopathy. And, uh, we teach this to help osteopaths uh, to grow towards uh, an understanding of a, a broader sense of osteopathic 
practice, you know, so a more uh, constitutional approach as well as uh, helping people with, with pain, which gives them a broader sense of uh, uh, ability to be able to practice. One more thing before we kind of start was uh, the word lesion or osteopathic spinal lesion is used a lot in this because it's, easy, it's easier for me to say that than it is somatic dysfunction. To be honest, I, I don't particularly like the word osteopathic spinal lesion because it implies, you know, bone A on bone E, bone, bone A on bone E, bone A on bone B um, is uh, misplaced in some way, which isn't really um, what's going on there. Uh, somatic dysfunction is another expression for it, which... Uh, uh, at least the word somatic implies that it's more than just a local thing, but because it is, you know, the, an osteopathic spinal lesion is really just a tip of an iceberg, and it impl and it sort of delves deep into the physiology of uh, of, of of the the owner of it. Okay, so the first real researcher in uh, osteopathy was Andrew Taylor Still, and his journey towards discovering osteopathy was because of his uh, disappointments in medicine, which is uh, you know which we all know, and uh, he followed what we know of and what he may have known of as the scientific method. So Dr. Steele performed early studies, and this was the process he he kind of followed. So further experiments uh, for quantitative studies were planned, and the scientific development moved on. And this is how osteopathy originated, and the organising idea of the lesion was kind of then developed. All right. So firstly, he made sort of observations on this and uh, the observations he made sort of increased in frequency, which he then obviously ruminated upon and uh, and uh, he made a tentative thesis and eventually a, a system or philosophy emerge, uh, emerges and uh, this then he tested his hypothesis. And, you know, this is how still carried out science. And this is the scientific method that we we know today. So moving on a little bit from that, uh, uh, in 1908, there was a discussion about who did the earliest research into uh, osteopathy. And in a, uh, uh, a 1908 edition of the Osteopathic Physician, uh, John Martin Littlejohn wrote that uh, uh, during the winter of 1898 to 99, experiments were conducted in an old barn on Osteopathy Avenue and in the ASO on human subjects and dogs in regard to the effect of stimulation and inhibition and the effects of lesions produced and their attempted correction. I have a number of sphygmograms and cardiograms taken that year and sections of heart, lung and spinal cord of dogs subjected to experiments under anesthesia. We dissected out the entire spinal cord made sections of the brain and watched the peristalsis and rhythm of internal organs. So that was a, a correlation between uh, Andrew Taylor Still, or Andrew Taylor Still instructing John Martin Littlejohn uh, in some experiments. John Martin Littlejohn was also instructed that to experiment on the use of morphine and quinine, iron and arsenic administered to animals with the objective of proving uh, as he tried to show in a few lectures given in 1898, 1899, that substances uh, like this were foreign to the body and produced detrimental instead of beneficial effects. And that was the beginning of his conception of the fallacies of medicine, which uh, was a subject that he delved into and lectured on for the following 10 years and, and throughout the rest of his career. This is uh, just a, an interesting page, which... Uh, shows how much uh, diversity of osteopathic practice there was uh, back in this day. Was, you know, this, this, we weren't just MSK practitioners uh, treating pain uh, then. So this is a page from uh, an 1898 to 1902 listing uh, presenting complaints and treatment results from 1,240 patients treated at Washington Institute of Osteopathy. And only 39 or 3% of these was called lumbago. There were some, about another 40 odd people with sciatica, I think, or no, 27 people with sciatica, which was uh, uh, described then as well. And the rest were generally systemic conditions. And uh, it also describes how well the patients responded to treatment. And uh, 
if they were completely cured, if they benefited greatly, uh, didn't benefit much at all, or didn't, didn't benefit at all. And uh, so I thought that was just a, an interesting thing. So it's, it's not just low back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, knee pain. It's, it, it was a, a much broader sense of, of health care. So the study of the lesion follows the same method of development of uh, uh, any sort of scientific discovery. So as I said, observations were made, a hypothesis formulated, and experimentation designed to prove or disprove the, the hypothesis. So by 1905, they were kind of had discovered what they thought this thing was the osteopathic lesion and they were starting some experiments and this chap that you can see here called Carl McConnell who I expect most of you are aware of he had been doing some experiments on a on a, a, a number of animals and uh, another chap called Pierce presented a similar work in 1905 and there was a report published in the Northern Osteopath Journal in August 1905 which detailed experiments performed in the physiology labs at the Pacific College of Osteopathy and both another chap called D. Cern and another one called Whiting were also conducting research individually at this time by inducing lesions and observing their effects. <clears throat> so following this, <clears throat> so following this the uh, AT Steel Research Institute was incorporated in 1906 uh, and grants from the Institute's endowment fund helped pay the expenses uh, of studies made in several college labs and clinics so they could do more research. So initially at the AT Still Research Institute they set up laboratories and clinics in Sh Chicago which was the, where the Little John uh, College was and in moving on a little bit in 1917 the labs were moved to Chicago uh, from Chicago sorry to Sunny Slope California to provide um, a better facility and better conditions for the animals. Also within the clinics at Sunny Slope, they had, they had other clinics uh, in, uh, not within Sunny Slope, but as well as Sunny Slope, they had uh, clinics in South Pasadena and Baldwin, which also provided case reports useful for comparison with the experimental findings. So uh, um, research findings in, in, in real patients as well. So experiments performed in the Research Institute labs, which were from 1906 to 1936, and its successor, the Research Laboratories of the American Osteopathic Association, which was from 1936 to 1947, were published in the AT Steel Research Institute bulletins, numbers one to seven, but also in the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association on a, on a more regular basis, much like uh, research now published um, on an ongoing basis in, in peer-reviewed journals. Sorry, Robert, someone is asking how they did lesion the, the dogs. Okay, we'll be coming to that. Okay, please. We'll be coming to that. Please. <clears throat> what I want to do is just kind of set the scene a little bit first. Uh, you know, then we're going to talk about how they in, induced the lesions and uh, then uh, their findings from, from that. All right. So during this time, no attempt was made to separate human from animal observations, as the effects of lesions on viscera are very similar in all, mammal, in all mammals that they found. And uh, there is just variations in anatomy, like extra vertebra here away, and some physiological differences, which were species specific. But the pathophysiological effect of the lesion appeared to be the same in, in, all, in all species. Okay. So, Carl McConnell, uh, by 1905, he had uh, undertaken experiments on several hundred dogs over a six-year period. And so, with, with an assistant, dogs were lesioned under, under anesthesia, and no direct tissue damage uh, was caused. And the dogs were observed from three to 80 days after lesioning, before an autopsy was performed and where samples were collected. So after they did this, they, uh, they obviously they reported their studies and uh, the uh, microscopic examination of the spinal cord uh, showed that at the level of the lesion, structures of the cord, nerve roots and sympathetic branches, nerve roots and their branches. So I, I can't see what I've actually got written there because uh, the little box 
or video is covering it up. I don't know if we can get rid of that, Pindy. Uh, I'll get my uh, cursor back. Okay. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Let me just go into it from into the keynote from uh, my iPad. There we go. Just starting the slideshow, bear with me. So at the we'll start that again. At the level of the lesion, structures of the cord, nerve roots and their branches and the sympathetics corresponding to the lesion were pathologically damaged. The tissues of the controls showed no such changes. Various cell groups in the gray matter showed inflammatory changes and atrophy. Axon degeneration extended above and below the lesion. So they uh, put a lesion in a particular segment. As we know, the cord isn't uh, uh, segmental, but the damage extended above and below the area where they would have expected it to. Um, degeneration was traced from the nerve centers in the cord, the posterior root ganglion and sympathetics, and usually between a third and two thirds of the bundle were affected. And the, main, the fibers that were mainly affected were the, the vasomotor fibers, which is an interesting kind of correlation really as well, because uh, Andrew Taylor still had um, surmised that uh, the, the, the circulation was particularly important and that uh, the vasomotor control of uh, the uh, body was, and organ system was particularly important. And this is what they were finding here. So they observed uh, changes in blood vessels uh, to the outer adventitia of the arterioles, capillaries, veins, and sometimes the larger arteries. Uh, diapodesis and hemorrhage was evidence of local pathological change. So if you remember back to your uh, uh, bio biology undergraduate days, you'll pr probably remember sort of a, a basic pathology where um, inflammation starts by, you get this kind of marginalization of blood products um, within the artery or arterioles, arterial, the, the vessel wall becomes more permeable than blood products like uh, white blood cells and uh, mast cells and round cells and that's that kind of thing, um, disperse into the tissues through the blood vessel wall. But also because of that, you get uh, red blood cells uh, going through uh, these uh, permeable um, tissues. So they can see that these, these are actually pathological changes rather than direct tissue damage, which looks looks quite different, you know, a torn artery. So hyperemic arteritis uh, was seen due to local vasomotor changes, which extended above and below the segment involved. And there was a marked disturbance to the blood vessels of the sympathetics. And this vasomotor effect frequently extended to the neurologically related viscera. Pronounced hyperemia of the cord especially but not exclusively in the posterior horns and the medial sides of the anterior horns and ischemia was greatest at the level of the lesion. So as I said earlier, the level of the lesion was where the most damage and most ischemic change occurred and then the level above and below uh, wasn't quite so bad and it gradually kind of phased out to being um, non-pathologically changed after that. So and there also was congestion with diapodesis was noted in the anterior and posterior spinal cord vessels. So sort of evidence of inflammation again here. Now, McConnell mainly studied the uh, local effects of the lesion, but he did note some of the um, uh, visceral effects as, as mentioned before. And so this is looking at the, what they found had occurred and the pathophysiological effects that had occurred within the viscera uh, and the neurologically related viscera that is. So again they found di diapodesis and vessel congestion in the submucous coat of the stomach and intestines. They also found secretory motor and digestive powers were altered and reduced. Kidney disturbances of a vascular nature changed by the way of the vasomotors and congestion and a typical hemorrhagic infiltration. There was liver and spleen congestion and there was acutely disordered pancreatic damage and considerable congestion of the islets of Langerhans. And this was three days post lesion. Urinalysis shows raised glucose. So kind of a, a pre-diabetic kind of uh, level. So McConnell's conclusions after this were, was that the osteopathic lesion is something more than an effect at the foramina. So again, about this time when they were kind of uh, thinking about what was happening with the lesion, uh, um, 
a lot of the hypothetical ideas we're talking about it being to do with foraminal conclusion, which uh, um, if you've ever read Clark's Anatomy, which is a 1905 anatomy book, which is uh, really quite interesting, um, that tends to talk about uh, the effect being at the foramina. Uh, if you ignore that, it's still quite a good, quite a good, uh, an accurate anatomy book, and it gives you um, sort of osteopathic specific anatomy and uh, the uh, effects of lesions into the various viscera. Anyway, I digress. So McConnell's next conclusion was. Initially, there was a physiological disturbance in the muscular, fascial, ligamentous, and osseous tissues, which causes interference with normal afferentation to the spinal cord centers, which is more or less permanently maintained by the lack of freedom of the normal joint movements. This was quite interesting as well, because uh, when they produced a lesion and then they dissected away the tissues, they would see what was maintaining the, the lesion. So they, they'd section away the outer ligaments and still the lesion was pre present. They'd section away the ribs and uh, still the lesion was, was present. So they'd section away the, all the muscles and uh, uh, still the lesion was pre present. And they were only able to restore nat natural or normal movements to the joint once they'd sectioned away the, the capsular ligaments. So they, they believed that the uh, uh, lesion was maintained by uh, the capsular ligaments in, in these particular examples. Obviously, there's lots of other things which maintain lesions. So this initiated changes to the spinal cord at the level of the segment and to a lesser degree, the segments of the cord above and below. As we know, spinal cord isn't segmental, but it had a, a broader effect from the segmental effect going into the spinal cord. So this interface to the constant afferent feedback systems disturbs function of vasomotor and other centers. And vessel dilation and congestion is a, is a prominent feature. The arterioles, capillaries, and veins are pathologically affected by the disturbed innervation. The bloodstream is slowed, the endothelial tissue compromised, and plasma exudation takes place. So we're talking about these um, pathological effects, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, of the, uh, the vessel wall becoming more permeable. So this is followed by diapodesis, leading to small areas hem of hemorrhage, uh, especially in and around the nerve centers of the cord and the ganglia. And so thus, nutrition of local parts is jeopardized and causes parenchymatous degeneration. Many lesions, if not all, affected the health of the tissues and organs innervated and related to them. Therefore, acting as an etiological, predisposing or maintaining factor to disease processes. So this is what they were finding here with um, inducing uh, lesions. And, and it was a kind of... Uh, uh, demonstrated why still uh, when he was teaching people osteopathy and in his early days of osteopathy how he was able to help people recover from um, more constitutional uh, type maladies. So neural tissue especially the ganglia from the cord to the sympathetics and connective tissue are richly supplied by blood and the greatest disturbance seems to be in the nerve centers. And McConnell's final conclusion from this was Bearing in mind, this is a bit of a shortening of a number of years of work. Owing to the sensitivity of neural tissue to circulatory changes, it's a small step from functional impairment to organic disorder. Okay. So, Louisa Burns, I expect quite a few of you will have heard of her before. Oh, let me just, uh, I'll just come out of that. I've just got to open up this again now. And stick that back on to play. There we go. Sorry about that. So Louisa Burns was a very well-known osteopath in, in research, particularly the first 50 years of the, the 20th century. She was uh, the most dominant uh, person in osteopathic experimentation and research up until uh, Erwin Kaur and Denslow. And uh, her research was uh, the research that they did at uh, Sunny Slope uh, Laboratories in, in uh, California. And she graduated as a, an osteopath in 1903. She was born in 1868 and later completed a master's degree in science. And she came to osteopathy after suffering 
long-term effects from meningitis and was helped back to nearly full health by an osteopath her parents had taken to her to in California. And, and after this, she trained as an osteopath and dedicated her life to osteopathic experimentation and research. And so for the first half of the 20th century, she was the dominant figure in osteopathic research. And uh, her life's work was uh, studying the pathological changes associated with and following osteopathic lesions. She did have a very broad um, uh, experimental and uh, uh, research uh, facilities. So it wasn't just lesions, but this is arguably the most important part of her research and what she's, what she's best known for. So whereas McConnell put a lot of focus on the local effects of the lesion, Burns' research focused on uh, body-wide effects. But her, as I said, her labs were broader and a bit more varied and a bit more dedicated, as we'll come on to in a minute. And the experiments were mainly performed on small mammals, such as white rats, uh, rabbits, guinea pigs, and, and some cats. All right. So... Lesions were experimentally induced and always correlated to clinical observa observation to add practical value. So they also had these other labs where they were getting reports back from uh, uh, findings on, on human patients as well. So they were correlated with that. And she would make uh, um, good clinical correlations. So the conditions at uh, Sunny Slope Labs, which was a new lab built sort of de novo after sort of careful consideration of the previous sort of 15 years of osteopathic research. Uh, so they were, they were able to correlate all that information from the research that uh, McConnell, Pierce, Deason, Whiting and others had all done before. And with keeping at the sense of uh, Andrew Taylor Still's philosophy and principles in mind and also adhering to um, Hewlett's uh, uh, specific instructions. Uh, he was the uh, initial chairman or the first chairman of the research institute and, and these things were followed constantly. And the highest standard of technical methods in physiology, histology and related subjects were used uh, whenever they were applicable uh, to the experiments. And also preliminary experiments were performed in search of new methods uh, when these were needed and plans were formulated for further ongoing studies of uh, the lesion were made. So this was the sort of scientific uh, uh, process that, uh, that was followed. And so there's a kind of mission statement to which uh, Louisa Burns made in, in 1918, which she uh, um, continued to use up until 1947 when she, when she retired. So what she said, this is in 1918, uh, at this date, Clinical reports and experimental evidence justifies the formulation of a provisional statement or thesis uh, to be subjected to further study. This hypothesis may be stated briefly. The abnormal condition called a bony lesion exists and it may cause disease in distant parts of the body. So to make this statement, she'd correlated all the information she'd got back from all the other osteopaths who'd been doing this type of research and they'd all had similar results. So additionally, Burns stated to this, this raises several problems and their solution is essential to further and more adequate study. One, if the abnormal, the abnormal condition called a bony lesion is truly a disturbance in the normal relations of bones, a similar condition could be produced in lab animals by strains and other conditions as might cause the bony lesion in human subjects. Two, if the bony lesion can be produced in animals, either as a disturbance in bony relations or some other pathological condition, disease should occur in distant parts of the bodies of the animals, providing this hypothesis is a fact and correct. Three, if these two conditions can be met, the, cor the correction of the bony lesions should result in at least partial recovery of diseases produced. So at least partial recovery of diseases produced. The extent of recovery dependent on the extent of pathological changes uh, which have been produced. And four, if these three conditions can be met, a study of the tissue changes concerning, sorry, concerned during pathogenesis and recovery should increase our understanding of the nature of bony lesions and of the changes produced in tissues, both local and distant, and should render prognosis more accurate, treatment more efficient, and preventative measures of greater value. 
so plans were made to kind of follow this kind of line of, uh, uh, of questioning. So Burns said, the first step of this is to be the search for efficient and adequate methods of producing the same type of bony lesions in lab, anim in lab animals as we find in humans. If this can be established, the first condition of the hypothesis is established. Further studies of the uh, lesion and its effect will thus be facilitated. So several methods had, had been devised for producing lesions in different areas and imitating several causes of lesions in, Persian, in, in persons. So they they'd kind of were there with that to a certain degree, but she wanted to improve on that uh, to make the experiments better, kinder to animals uh, and more reproducible. The second step is to be the study and the description of the tissues concerned in the lesion and at various intervals of time after the lesion has been produced. So in other words, they would um, euthanize animals quite soon after producing lesions in the same way McConnell had and compare them to uh, control groups and uh, then at, set, at predetermined um, times they would do this and, and uh, see what changes the lesion had made in the local and distant tissues. The third step is to be the continued comparative observation of lesioned animals and of similar animals not lesioned as controls. And these observations are to be terminated at different time interval, intervals by euthanizing and autopsy of the subjects, which is what I was just saying. The fourth step is to search for adequate methods of correction of the lesions and study the results of the correction. So after this, they had to, to decide what uh, the criteria of this existence of a, a bony lesion was uh, within these laboratory animals. So the criteria for the existence of a lesion was uh, in, in the animals was uh, a palpable disturbance in bony relations with no evidence of trauma to the tissue. So no bleeding, no fracture, uh, no rupture of tissues. And there would be abnormal palpable qualities of adjacent soft tissues. And these two objective factors alone uh, were, to, were considered essential to the diagnosis of a bony lesion uh, for the experiments to be planned. And, and this is in a similar way, you know, we use, uh, uh, or certainly when I was educated, I'm not so sure now that we use... Uh, uh, the uh, tart, which is tissue, uh, texture, asymmetry, uh, tenderness, and uh, uh, whatever the last one is uh, on that. So it's, just, it's very similar to the palpitary changes that we would find uh, that we use these days. So initially, animals were purchased or donated, and the animals that were considered normal, uh, the animals were, that were considered normal after examination were selected for, selected for a preliminary experiments or breeding. And the criteria for being normal were, were, were many, you know, uh, apart from uh, uh, the absence of uh, uh, asymmetry and bony relations and tissue tenderness and that sort of thing, but uh, they were given a, a kind of full medical as much as uh, they could be. So by careful breeding, uniform strains of animals were developed. And by studying these more accurate uh, findings were obtained. Uh, criteria for... Sorry? I think we, we, we see the slide behind. Are you one? Because we don't see what you are talking now. Sometimes people accidentally put the hand up thing, so... Uh... It's, uh, I'll carry on. Yeah, you, you ch did, did you change the slide? or Because we don't see... I haven't, I haven't, I haven't changed the slide. It should be on the one that says mission statement at the top. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, so that that's uh i can change the slide there we go this but that's the next one so we go back that's i'm not quite there yet okay so criteria for correction of the lesion was a return to normal palpable position of the bones and a return to normal of the palpably disturbed soft tissues yeah much like when you know when we're treating patients every day and uh, the criteria for disease included any departure from normal findings, both anti-mortem, you know, before dissection and uh, post-mortem. And uh, this wasn't just done by, you know, one person all the time. They, they had, the tissue findings had to be corroborated by at least two researchers, each blinded to the other's findings. And if they didn't agree, the animal was returned to the cage and not used for breeding but could be used for preliminary studies provided the appropriate records were made and considered. 
and at autopsy, the cause of disagreement uh, was searched for and those who disagreed informed of the findings. So it's very strict and, and very well controlled. And this process, which I've just, just described, was how they followed these research experiments uh, from 1918 right up until 19, about 1950. So the latest results of experiments which hadn't been included were then published in uh, um, the various journals that they had and the uh, uh, Journal of the American Osteopathic Association and the research bulletins, like I said earlier. And uh, the, the, the Burns's final work was, was published in uh, a book which was uh, in, published in 1947, which went up under the catchy title of uh, The Pathogenesis of Visceral Disease Following Vertebral Lesions, which is a bit of a synopsis of uh, uh, the work they did, but it's, it doesn't go into a huge amount of detail, which some of our other publications did. So as mentioned earlier, Burns was one of a number of researchers doing very similar research to this, and they worked in different labs during the same years without any discussion of their findings until experiments were complete and published, and they all had very, very similar results. So going back to lesion production, which is what someone was interested in, uh, what they tried to do was imitate the forces and directions which produced the lesion in a person. And so this was to imitate the lesion that might have been caused by accidental trauma, um, which might be previously described by a patient. You know, I lifted something in the garden. And this is what McConnell said uh, of what was called the traumatic type um, of lesion production, which is a bit of a misnomer really, because there was no direct tissue damage. And he said, it cannot be performed in a haphazard manner and strict attention to the thorough relaxation of the local tissues and definite application of mechanical principles are demanded. After selecting your animal, a small or medium sized dog is best, surgical anesthesia is necessary. A simple way is to place the animal flat on its belly, completely under surgical anesthesia, then while an assistant bears down with his thumbs upon the selected vertebra, the operator grasps the animal by the rear legs and exerts traction in line with the spinal cord until the spinal muscles thoroughly relax and stretch. Then immediately, while still maintaining the traction, hyperextend and rotate the spine until the desired point is felt to give or slip. Or, and I think this is the, probably the traumatic bit, um, while still maintaining the traction, have an assistant suddenly exert pressure or a thrust upon the desired vertebra. So the technique was not carried out to the extent where there was any tissue damage or bruising, um, but there was also a similar technique for producing rib lesions uh, using blocks and uh, such the like. So Deason, who was one of the other osteopaths doing this experimental research, um, he had a very similar uh, technique to, of producing uh, lesions as McConnell and so did a, a lot of the other osteopaths using um, surgical anesthesia but the methods they used at Sunny Slope imitated more natural uh, conditions uh, after understanding uh, McConnell's ways and the early researchers reports they developed uh, um, some what they thought were preferable ways to developing lesions or putting lesions into animals so they imitated more natural conditions and uh, required no anesthesia. Um, but before producing lesions, a preliminary study was made of the animals um, to be used to confirm that they were of a similar type, species, and the same age. And this was to establish familiarity uh, with the characteristic and normal extent of mobility in different areas of these various different animals' spines as well. So they also had... Um, um, flexible spines which they'd preserved from other animals which they would study the angles of the facets and how the joints moved and that sort of thing so uh, uh, they could do it with a uh, relative ease. So with the knowledge gained from the experimental studies Burns was able to produce permanent lesions with uh, little difficulty. Uh, so to make a lesion a vertebral level was selected uh, in planning the experiment so depending on what they were doing they'd use a different particular uh, part of the spine. So other, other vertebrae were held firmly in their normal position and the selected vertebrae are moved 
in the articular plane in a direction determined by the preliminary studies. When the limit of normal motion is reached, slight sudden additional pressure in the same plane was exerted, forcing the vertebra just beyond its normal range of movement and causing a slight strain of the tissues. A variation on this take was, in technique was also used when the limit of normal motion was reached, pressure was maintained until a very slight further movement of the vertebra, apparently due to the sudden yielding of the articular tissues was felt. So the tissues fatigued, uh, really. Uh, the lesion produced like this was usually permanent until it was intentionally corrected. This method they felt resembled the human lesion based upon uh, the sort of thing we see in clinical practice, uh, like postural strains, um, work-related strains, habits, and uh, which sometimes be augmented by a mechanical strain and trauma. And so to really try and uh, emulate uh, some of the effects that we see due to constant gravity, the constant effect of gravity uh, on, on, the on our structures too. So in other cases, a very slight stress is repeatedly applied to a bony process of the selected vertebra. So usually about 200 such stresses, stresses sort of tapping uh, on, on the vertebra in a particular direction, um, given within two or three minutes, that this also produced uh, the desired lesion in smaller or younger animals. And uh, it was quite uh, labor intensive, that technique, because they'd have to do that several several times a day and uh, but they found that such a lesion uh, was usually persistent and it, as i said it worked quite well in the younger animals there were also other methods that were used and uh, some methods which were tried and dismissed and uh, um, th these were the ones which they uh, uh, found that worked best so an interesting point actually was uh, i just put this in um, because i thought it was interesting um, an interesting point was made by Burns as she noticed that progeny of lesioned or abnormal animals at Sunny Slope often presented deformed vertebrae and ribs more often than the controls. And Cox and Tasker, two other uh, early osteopathic uh, pioneers, had described similar anatomical variations in humans. And Burns also made some other more or other clinically uh, useful comments about lesions, such as. And I think this is quite interesting, really, because uh, um, I'd kind of uh, found this myself through through years of uh, clinical practice, and that the best way to correct newly formed lesions uh, was to use the techniques which involved very slow movements, as these forced the edema through the tissues and capillary beds slowly without injury, whereas sudden sharp corrective technique caused further inflammatory reaction, greater edema, and uh, you can imagine. Uh, the effect of forcing a lot of fluid through a constrained um, capillary and tissue bed. All right. <clears throat> so greater edema and frequent, uh, more frequent recurrence of the lesion would occur if, if, if they tried to force new lesions. But later on in older lesions or lesions that had been present uh, in young rabbits, for example, during the second month um, of existence of the, the mobility of the of the existence of the lesion, the mobility of the joint had decreased uh, and it makes correction difficult and was best accomplished by quick sudden movements. So, uh, but two months in a rabbit, I think I worked out to be, work out something like a, 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 in the lifetime of a rabbit was about a year in a human. I think rabbits live to about seven years old, unless you're one of Louisa Burns's rabbits and uh, it worked on the basis of a human living to 80 years old if they're lucky or unlucky, as the case may be. So using these, uh, uh, using these uh, quicker and sudden movements, so any, any technique that caused too much edema or extravasation of blood into the tissues, though, was harmful. So even with it's an, old, an older lesion, a more chronic lesion, you still had to be pretty careful, which I'm, you know, I, I hope everyone is. And uh, if this was harmful and, and it caused further fibrosis of the tissues. So the typical pathology in viscera affected by lesions that Louisa Burns and her uh, colleagues found over, over these years um, 
although certain visceral changes immediately follow the production of a lesion, the development of definite disease in the viscera resembles the more gradual evolution, gradual evolution of chronic or degenerative diseases, uh, which are known to occur in persons or in animals. So each step in pathogenesis leads to the next step. So, for example, uh, the uh, hyperemia is followed by edema and congestion is followed by hemorrhages and fibrosis follow due to the hemorrhages is followed by ischemia and then hypertension. So this is the result they found in, in all lesioning, in all structures. So you had hyperemia followed by edema and congestion and hemorrhages, fibrosis followed by edema and then hypertension. So these in turn were followed by other pathological changes, which were tissue or organ specific, you know, depending on which, which organ they were in, in the body. So after lesioning, immediate circulatory changes in tissues was observed. There was a transient or effervescent paling uh, that would occur due to the vasomotor reflex in the in the nerve center so and this this couldn't hold you know reflex like this is, is relatively transient so it, it can't stay permanent like that so this fluctuated and was not always visible but then the viscera became bright a brighter scarlet than normal so we're talking with we're seeing this sort of start to see a passive congestion there so microscopic examination found that the arterioles contained more blood vessels than normal so we're getting this these pathological changes of um marginalization of blood products within the vessel and uh, the peripheral plasma layer uh, had become very thin and at this initial point uh, immediately after lesioning the venu venules were not observed to be affected but during this sort of uh, three to twenty minute um, period post lesioning uh, the affected viscera begins to assume a purplish tinge and within an hour or so, the color suggested a venous blood is uh, increased in the viscous. So by this time, we're getting a kind of venous stasis as well as the arterial stasis. So we're getting it at, at both ends now. A microscopic examination of the living tissues showed that the venules, as well as the arterioles, are congested with cells and areas of di diapodesis are starting to appear. So the blood vessels are becoming more permeable and blood products going through the blood vessel wall into the local tissues, including the ones that aren't really supposed to, like red blood cells. The resulting hemorrhages uh, were, were minute at this point, and uh, the blood was not coagulated. This is three to 20 minutes post lesioning. After two or more hours, edema becomes more palpable in the affected viscera, and microscopic examination of these living tissues revealed the cells separating by a layer of fluid, which was recognizably more abundant uh, than in the uh, control animals. So later circulatory changes. So during the first few months after lesion production, the hyperemia is followed by a form of chronic arterial congestion. Though an, an associated dilation of the venules gives it a certain quality of venous congestion. The affected tissues remain slightly purplish, slightly purplish in colour and they become edematous to varying degrees and cooler than the control tissues. So they always had controls with these. Petechial hemorrhages continue to occur and a brownish stain is left after the extravasated blood is carried away in the lymphatic system. Other hemorrhages are followed by coagulation of the blood, infiltration by small round cells, and organization and formation of scar tissue, so chronic changes. During the second year and thereafter, a general and progressive fibrosis involves the affected tissues. The capillaries, venules, and arterioles often show almost complete occlusion and varying de degrees of ischemia are shown in microscopic examination of slides uh, prepared from these tissues. So what led to the ischemia was then the hypertension as well, so increased blood pressure. We see that a lot these days, I think. Okay, slides prepared from several months post lesioning sometimes show a few or several blood cells beneath the intima of the arterioles and venules, and less commonly beneath the intima of larger vessels. So it's the, it was the capillary beds mainly, the small minute um, stuff, which were the kind of battlefield 
of uh, pathology where that kind of exists really. So less commonly beneath the intima of the larger vessels that was shown, but these cells uh, were, were shown to be in the process of penetrating the intima as well by diapodesis. So the later, that was the later uh, circulatory changes, but the, the later cellular changes, uh, what they found is the, the forms of degeneration found in different viscera seem to differ. Um, but always seem to be due to either circulatory or innovation disturbances. So blood, blood supply or vasomotor supply, typically. There would be a cloudy swelling, uh, is most often found in nerve or glandular cells, and it appears within one to three weeks after lesion production. When it is found in a, in a group of the same animals with the same lesion produced at the same time, its presence can be assumed for similar cells in other members of the lesion group. Okay, so they'd have a, a group of animals where they put exactly the same lesion in, and some they would be um, euthanizing and doing autopsies on and study, others they would let live longer, and others they would have as controls. So it was assumed, assumed as they were uh, the animals that they did autopsies on and studies at a particular point in time. Um, had these pre-pathological changes or pathological changes within their tissues after lesion production, it would be assumed that the rest of the group, apart from the controls, were like it. So when the other members of the group, were sub of the lesion group, were subjected to treatment of the lesion, then left to live for several weeks, at autopsy, the evidence of the cloudy swelling or any of the other abnormal conditions was usually impossible to find. So this is, again, is... Uh, correlating kind of uh, uh, or validating Stills kind of hypothesis uh, about uh, the effect of these bony lesions uh, being having distant effects on uh, tissues and affecting people's health and, and how he, he was able to help people with more than uh, um, back pain. Uh, nothing wrong with helping people with back pain. Well, mind. Well, what, someone is asking, uh, do you have any thoughts of uh, why, why there is a cooling effect, not a heat effect on the lesion? Uh, yes, the, it, it would be to do with the uh, circulation and retained blood um, in the, because uh, it's a passive congestion. Um, there's, there's inflammation involved, but not gross inflammation. The inflammation is, is more at a um, cellular level, and uh, you're getting a gross kind of uh, uh, lack of new blood coming in, which would be warm, and old blood going out, so it'd be cooler. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> So thus it, was thus it was concluded that if the lesion was corrected at an early stage, the cloudy swelling um, that followed it uh, would normally recover and the structure of the affected cell would recover. So palpable differences were noticed in the viscera of lesioned animals and, and the human subjects as well. So, uh, so, uh, so there were palpable differences within the, the, the viscera of, of lesion to non lesion animals, as well as um, humans with lesions and humans without lesions. And experimentation was also performed regarding reflex mechanisms related to visceral pathogenesis. So we're talking about the uh, uh, viscerosomatic um, lesioning, which has been studied by many, many people uh, since then too. So, <clears throat> this is a sample, uh, not that it's not, actually, this is not what you're seeing here, but I'm about, just about to read to you, uh, uh, yeah, I'll go back to the other page, uh, uh, a sample set of results, which was after some experimental lesions were produced, uh, L1 to 3. And this is uh, some ex experiments that they did uh, and observations on female re reproductive anatomy. So after they produced lesions at L1 to 3, uh, they noticed that in the ovary, the, ov the ovum cells showed some cloudy swelling and the graphinian, graphian sorry, follicles appeared to be more edematous than usual. The hemorrhagic areas appear very large in the uterine tissues and this hemorrhage is often always by diapodesis, so again pathological change, not trauma. And the blood is found in various varying shades of reddish brown and yellow according to the time um, since its extravasation. 
and the superficial cells in the uterine lining may be variously disintegrated and degenerated in, in a way which is never found in the uterus of the non-lesioned healthy animal. The gross appearance of the heavy edematous dark colored uterus of lesioned animals is easily recognized. So they could, they, they, they've done this a lot and they could recognize uh, uh, a pathologically changed or pre-pathologically uh, changed uh, uh, uterus or tissues from uh, the controls which were, which were normal. So you can imagine how this kind of thing would, would affect humans too. So more generally, these kind of next results show what was typically found in viscera after experimental lesioning um, of various spinal segments was put in. So we're just going to kind of run through, there, through those. So upper cervical lesions, when they in, induced experimental lesions into the upper cervical spine, and this included the occiput C1, C2, and 3. And uh, that, that forms a, a, a kind of group which tends to have pretty similar effects when, when lesioned. And uh, this is thought to be due to the effects on the superior cervical ganglia, which is, acts as a, uh, a bit of a, a motorway for the autonomic nervous system into the uh, brainstem and, and out. And, uh, but it also affects the, uh, the vagus nerve, which, which, which comes, in, comes in there. So the, 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 the effects are pretty variable at this level. But what they particularly noticed, uh, that there was hyperemia of the conjunctiva, hyperemia of the retina, hyperemia of the nasopharyngeal membranes and inner and middle ear, hyperemia of the meninges, hyperemia of the cerebral cortex and pituitary gland. So we're getting a kind of condition where the environment is set up um, that uh, some other kind of pathology uh, may uh, end up existing. So it's alterating the local terrain and the environment. And as we know, you know pathology is uh, 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 multifactorial. But this is kind of predisposing some of these some of these people or animals here. So motor disturbances of the heart, diaphragm, and stomach. There were slightly dilated pupils which reacted slowly to light. Acidity of the gastric secretion is increased, and which was thought to be partly due to the increase in the pyloric sphincter tone, which was commonly found in this lesion. So that could be to uh, to do with the, the vagus as well. But also some of these some of these effects uh, could also be uh, uh, you know some kind of a, a general an adaptation and neuroendocrine immune effects too. Uh, but uh, uh, the more tissue specific ones, like we were talking about, the tissue changes in the uterus uh, were, were seem to be always caused by the uh, changes at the segmental level rather than more global changes. So upper thoracic. Lesions. They did. They didn't. Uh, they did put in some mid cervical lesions, but uh, because the relationship of the uh, cervical spine uh, isn't that close to the middle cervical ganglion generally, they didn't find anything which uh, uh, that I found particularly interesting, apart from spasm of the esophagus. But when we move down to the sort of upper thoracic lesions, the the inferior cervical ganglion, which, which has a, a very intimate relationship to the first thoracic and to the first uh, rib. And lesions affecting this ganglia often appear as a group. So they included C7 to, to T3 within this group. And uh, the T1 to T3 segments contain nerve centers which overlap, again, as the cord, cord isn't a segmental area. So some of these centers extend down as far as T4, 5 as well. And uh, there is, to some degree, a crossover here because of the this as well as the inferior cervical ganglion being a, a relay station for the middle cervical ganglion, the superior cervical ganglion, ganglion and vice versa. So you get a bit of a crossover and mishmash of symptoms with some of these. Mm -hmm. So you'll see some of the things that they reported were very similar to the upper cervical ones. So there was hyperemia of the eye tissues, hyperemia of the nasopharyngeal membranes, thyroid, the brain, meninges, hyperemia of the pituitary gland, uh, hyperemia of the external, middle, and inner inner ear on this occasion. So there are also changes in uh, motor activities of the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. Talking about uh, motor activities of uh, esophagus, I'll just have a quick drink. Um, gastric secretions uh, are more acidic, and pyloric sphincter remains closed for longer. So again, you know, some of this might be a uh, um, have some slightly different hormonal kind of effects. Um, 
there was a slight dilation of pupils and they showed a slower reaction to light than changes. But in animals with long-standing lesions, uh, this is uh, again a bit more interesting um, because this is the effect of uh, uh, on the tissue, the distant tissues from the lesions. So in animals with long-standing or chronic lesions, the same as you know human beings get, uh, small pharyngeal polyps were usually present and cataracts commonly were present, present as well or commonly developed. So also they would find that they would uh, more likely to suffer from subluxation of the retina and other eye diseases were, were also common. And also there were sort of cardiac arrhythmias as well. So the mid thoracic lesions, we're, we're talking about T3 to 4 down to, or T3, 4 down to T9. The nerve centers controlling the heart and pulmonary, pulmonary circulation extend through T2 to 5. And in experiments on animals, T3, 4, and 5 lesions were followed by hyperemia of the myocardium. So you'd get the longer term effects of hyperemia, con uh, edema, congestion, and then uh, followed by infiltration of the uh, uh, fibrous tissue, ischemia, and uh, uh, hypertension there as well in the, in the coronary uh, tissues of uh, myocardium. And it was, these would be followed by particular hemorrhages, edema, minute masses of uh, fibrous connect, connective tissue, and as I just said, ischemia and atrophy of some of the myocardial cells, so heart disease. Uh, also, they'd find hyperemia of the gastric mucosa, hyperchlorhydria, and erosions followed by peptic ulcer. In fact, in some of these animals, that every single one that had a lesion, uh, I think it was T4 um, or 5, would get a gastric erosion. The bronchial vessels of the upper and middle lobes of the lungs become more engorged. Though this condition is often masked by the large volume of blood carried by these vessels anyway, it was, it was uh, recognized. And T6 to 9 presented a different picture in lesioned animals, uh, uh, really, because it was a bit more general. So there'd be attacks of diarrhea, occasional drops in blood pressure, so a visceromotor uh, control issue, perhaps. So not visceromotor, vasomotor control issue, perhaps, uh, with uh, um, too much blood going into the uh, mesenteric uh, circulation, perhaps. Um, increased extensibility and decreased elasticity of the gastric and intestinal smooth muscles, so degeneration, really. Sometimes dilation of the stomach, enlargement of the spleen, which is quite a common finding. Uh, edema and hyperemia of the pancreas uh, with degeneration of the islets of Langerhans, uh, much like uh, McConnell had found in his dogs earlier, which was like a pre-diabetic uh, situation. And uh, in the younger animals, there was a gradual kind of malnutrition which, uh, which occurred. The lower thoracic lesions, so T9 to L2, uh, were, uh, even though L2, L1 and L2 aren't thoracic, they, they included this in this group. Um, in experimental animals, these lesions were followed by hyperemia and edema, hyperemia and edema, particular hemorrhages, small knot-like masses of connective tissue which develop at sites of the hemorrhages, and finally a general fibrosis and ischemia. And the viscera involved in this were the uterus, the ovaries, the adrenals, and the ileocecal tissues. So in all those tissues, let's just go through that again, the uterus, the ovaries, the adrenals, the kidneys, and the ileocecal tissues, with lesions of this area, you'd get a hyperemia, edema, particular hemorrhages, small knot-like masses, connective tissue uh, developing at the sites of the hemorrhages, and finally, ischemia. So hyperemia of the testes was, was not marked, but edema of the scrotal tissues was fairly constant, and sterility in both sexes uh, was frequent. Uh, spontaneous abortion tended to occur frequently in the lesioned animals, but not in the uh, control animals, uh, and whether the lesion was in the male or the female. Obviously, it's not the males that have abortions. Uh, so there was an increase in body weight, which was quite, a pop, quite common, which was apparently uh, due to water retention, which was fairly common. So I assume that was something to do with the uh, kidney disease. And also that there was uh, some normal, sorry, I haven't moved that on, have I? There was some abnormal contraction of the psoas and lumbar muscles, which was uh, often spasmodic and frequent. So uh, with these lesions, they saw the good old lumbago, you know, the kind of things that we tend to see on a 
on a on a day to day basis in our clinics. So lumbar lesions, they only really did those down to about L3 because uh, the rigidity of the tissues below that made it very difficult to produce lesions reliably. So we only really have, uh, uh, or particularly in quadrupeds anyway, um, we only really have kind of uh, information about that down, down to there. Okay, so there we go, just go, oh, go back. So for 50 years, Louisa Burns studied the effects of osteopathic spinal lesions or somatic dysfunction or whatever you'd like to cause them on tissues. And with very few exceptions, there was a single constant response in all tissues. So the local and distant tissues uh, responded by having an ischemic response. So these are some of the uh, last seen animals escaping from uh, sunny slopes of laboratory. They were lucky, the, the, ones, the ones that got away here. So the, the lesion, as I said earlier, is really the tip of the iceberg and it's the uh, palpable component of our physiology which delves deep inside us and has wide ranging effects on the body and uh, um, is, should be included as a factor in depleting natural immunity and our body's own capability to heal itself. So uh, you know, I believe that you know, it's, it's as relevant today uh, as it always was. So it's important that we uh, you know, use this constitutional uh, approach in looking after our patient's health as well as helping their pain. So that's, that's the end. I'll just uh, unshare that if I can. How do I, pre How do I get out of the share thing? Here we go. Uh, stop share. Thank you for sitting there and listening. For those of you who have uh, stayed with us. Thank you. Is there any questions? Yeah, well, I, I threw you some questions. Uh, uh, people were asking, were asking about the slides. I think there was some confusion with the slides or, or the reading that you were doing. Oh, yeah. Well, I wasn't reading. I, I was putting some stuff up and then I was also uh, putting some background and additional information rather than just putting it all up on slides. Yeah. And then I'd forget to roll on the slide towards the end. So my apologies for that. That's okay. But that, that was a great information that you have uh, made a, a huge summary for all of us. I, I believe this is such a wide subject. Uh, but yeah, it was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, it's, just, it's just really, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a snapshot into the work that these early osteopaths did. And, you know, the amount of work they did was, was huge and vast. And this is what validated uh, Stills and, and Little John's approaches, uh, you know, to uh, uh, have a constitutional effect on our general health and why it's important to recognize these things and, and still work within that framework uh, of principles and philosophy, as well as, uh, as, as, well as the more modern uh, methods. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I totally agree. I, I didn't realize that uh, uh, McConnell spent six years doing some experiments on those animals as well, which is, you know, nowadays you, you, you expect to do something in, in three months. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you, you can imagine, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, these days re applying for a research grant, grant, grant that, uh, you know, I want to kill lots of furry animals and it's going to take me five to ten years to come out with some, um, some useful data. Um, you, you, you're probably not going to get any funding uh, for that, which is why I think it's important to, that we use this and why I spend a bit of time going over uh, the, how thorough they were with this and that it, um, that it was really, really good quality uh, um, experimentation. Yes, it was of its day, um, but uh, I don't think anything these days would surpass it. Yeah. There are some, a couple of questions. Is there uh, any information on the osteopathic lesion and the trigger points? Well, I, I think uh, trigger points and uh, osteopathic lesions uh, will coexist together because I think uh, uh, an osteopathic lesion is quite often um, uh, an air, well, it's usually an area of, of strain uh, or injury. So with that, you'll get... Um, local muscular changes because of the feedback loops into the CNS so you may well get trigger point formation as well but I, I believe you know you should treat both uh, treat both of both of those things um, and try and work out which one is the maintaining factor yeah 
I think uh, trigger points are extremely important. And then you can correlate those to uh, Chapman's reflexes and, and that kind of thing as well. Definitely, yeah, that's important. Uh, was the ischemic response associated with uh, corresponding congestions uh, elsewhere? Yes, well, there, 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 there is a, a process uh, which followed after um, all, oops, sorry, a process which uh, uh, occurred that was, oh, hang on a second, I've just gone on to, sorry about that. Uh, that occurred, which was um, relatively constant through um, all of these researchers. All, all the researchers found pretty much the same thing. You'd get some, lo initially after form creating the lesion, you'd get local vasomotor changes, and then that would fit the fatigue. So you, you'd get like a passive congestion immediately afterwards in the arterioles. And this would uh, be followed by slowing of the blood constituents and the um, the blood vessel walls would become more permeable and the blood constituents would uh, go out of the vessel into the local tissues. And while this was occurring, because you're getting a passive congestion in the arteriole, you'd get also get that in the venial. So this was three to 20 minutes after lesioning. So it all happened pretty quickly. Yeah. So then with the passive congestion, you'd then get edema. And then with edema, you tend to get fibrosis. And with the fibrosis, you'd get ischemia. And then ischemia, you'd get, um, well, ischemia is degeneration. So it's, it's, fibrosis is degeneration. And then that led to ischemia. And uh, the ischemia also led to uh, uh, hypertension. So there was that sequence of events which occurred in pretty well every experiment where they induced lesions into animals. Yeah. And that is the constant. And that is the takeaway thing from this that when someone has a lesion, that is what will be happening to them on the neurologically related viscera. And they may have been had that problem for years and years, but never had any, never noticed any problem. But that could be why uh, that particular person is, uh, has a preponderance to things going to their chest if they had a, a T4 to 6 lesion or something like that, because they have a slight degree of bronchial congestion or, or something like that. So it could, could explain people's um, slight Achilles heels for want of a better expression. Yes. Um, they ask uh, uh, lesions in the upper dorsal area will cause hyper or hypo uh, function of the pituitary gland. Yes. Yeah. So it was lesions at T4 would ca cause hyperchlorhydria, and I think T6 was hypochlorhydria. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's what that, that's what they found. Yes. Yeah. Um, Simeon is asking: Does the fact this research was performed on animals detract from the research, or it is still considered valid? This sort of, uh, yeah. It, it, the yeah. Well, I I, I I I don't think it is. It, I mean, what they noticed was that um, that uh, the the effects on the, the various different mammals that they used, the effects on the spinal cord and on the uh, different viscera uh, were the same. And so it was assumed that it was the same on humans as well. And in the experimentation that they were able to do on humans, that they would find congestion in organs and that sort of thing. Obviously, they didn't euthanize humans and, and dissect them. But uh, as far as they could establish, like looking at their... Um, pharynx and that sort of thing so they'd look at the vasomotor changes for that they'd look at the for the hyperemia in people's retina and on their conjunctiva and the thing that the living tissues that they could see that they would, they would observe and the the tissues that they could observe happened in the same way as it did all the other mammals uh, that that they observed and uh, so they assumed that it was that it would be similar but that that is one of the fundamental questions that we always find with animal research and uh, human research you know the correlation between them i mean obviously there's mammals physiology is very very similar to to us because we're mammals um but uh, you know we have some uh, anatomical differences and uh, and some uh, uh, some physiological differences but uh, all the findings that they found in these were the same across all mammals mm. so whether it's still valid 
I think it should still be valid because it was it, it was experimentation and it was uh, extremely well controlled and structured structured and uh, um, if if people did that research now it would find exactly the same thing so why should it not be valid it's like having to revalidate that the earth, the earth is round um, every every 10 years because uh, um, whoever I can't remember who, it was, who decided that the earth wasn't flat anymore but uh, you know ha having to revalidate that every every 10 years would be a uh, kind of ridiculous really it's kind of self-evident self-evident yeah. I agree with that. Someone is asking, uh, is there any, any experimentation done on uh, cranial lesions, like, for example, uh, after the dental extra extraction? Um, not, not in this um, uh, stuff that I've, not, not at the, in the research and the, experiment, the experimentation that I've looked at, but that would, that would be really quite fascinating too. Yeah, I don't know if someone like Charlotte Weaver did anything like did anything like that, um, or any of Sutherland's people. But I haven't heard of anything like that done. But it would yeah. be really interesting to see, because yeah. a cranial lesion is no different to to any other lesion apart from the effects of it are going to be um, relatively specific uh, neurologically, like uh, spinal segments. Mm, exactly, yeah. I should imagine. Very good. Yeah, everybody is saying how, how good the lecture was and how great the, the, the sort of information and the topic that you cover. So, yeah, thank you very much. If we don't have any more questions, uh, we okay. can. Okay, okay. Well, I, I thank, every, thank you everyone for listening. I, I th the reason why I talk about this is because I think it's particularly important that we take notice of it. And, and also, you know, this kind of stuff is still available to learn. It's in the BSO library, and it's also, we teach this kind of stuff on the Institute courses. So if you want to uh, uh, come and learn it, uh, you know, that, that's, where, that's, that's where you can learn it and learn this kind of approach. There's not many yeah. places that you can do that these days. I think it's the, the, the foundation of osteopathy to talk about the, the osteopathic lesion. And it's nowadays yeah. something is is a subject that we cover enough, or people just don't believe in in the lessons. Yeah, anymore. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, I fear that terribly at some point, sir. That uh, you know, uh, uh, we're we're, we're going to start getting um, graduates coming out, and uh, uh, you know, they'll, they'll they'll have been told that uh, um, you know, there's no such thing, or uh, or or whatever, you know. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so yeah. I think us, us older osteopaths, it's kind of our duty to try and um, tell the story and pass on the story. Yeah. So la last question, is, is there any comments on implications for treatment with these lesions? Would you suggest anything? Yeah, yeah uh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. You have to address the lesion, you know, and uh, by that I don't mean you know, crack it, uh, you, you know, you have to address why the lesion was there and get behind the lesion. Um, you know, quite often the lesion is there because of some uh, degree of gravitational stress or strain. And probably, probably most of them are there due to some gravitational stress or strain. So, uh, and it's there to uh, uh, allow um, movement to exist. Uh, um, but that adaptation causes the adaptation into our viscera and other tissues you know so it has it as a consequence um so yeah we have to get behind the lesion and deal with why it's there uh, to help people recover and usually you know that will deal with their pain as well not in everyone um but that usually will help most people's pain yeah integration yes Always. absolutely very good i think uh, we can finish there um, thank you very much, Rob. I I'll see you in a couple of weeks. And uh, thank you, everybody, yeah. who was uh, connected to, to this webinar. It's fantastic. Uh, and thank you, as always, to Pindi from Osteo All. And yeah, so I hope to see thank you, you soon. Pindi. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Diego. See you soon. See you soon. Bye, -bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye everyone! Bye.